Arthur Tellerman. I'm the research director of the Center for Public Leadership. And it is my pleasure to introduce not only my colleague, but an old friend of many years standing. Uh, we were interested in leadership for so many years, it's before leadership became sexy. That shows you how long we've been working in this field. Uh, Jeremy Post is a visiting scholar at the Center for Public Leadership for this uh, semester and uh, brings to us a perspective that we have uh, really lacked in many ways and focuses on areas of interest that are so obvious they need not even be enumerated. Let me say a few words about him uh, in terms of biography and then I will uh, turn the floor over to Jerry Post. Uh, Dr. Gerald Post is Professor of Psychiatry, Political Psychology, and International Affairs at George Washington University. Before coming to the university, and this is when I first met Jerry, he spent 21 years with the CIA. Ever heard of the CIA? Uh, where he founded and directed the Center for the Analysis of Personality and Political <coughs> Behavior. He played a leading role in the Camp David Talks, and he has published widely on areas relating to the psychology of political violence and terrorism, including also pertaining to weapons of mass destruction. His most recent book, uh, which is so recent that it has come out really only in the last few days, is called Leaders and Their Followers in a Dangerous World and is available from Cornell University Press. Jerry Post comments frequently on uh, the national media, and you may have heard him. The fact that he is, um, his work, the fact is that his work is really more timely than ever. And the boundary crossing that he has done between academia and government, really since the beginning of his professional life, uh, pertains particularly to the talk that he's going to give today. So it, it is with uh, some pride and particularly also personal pleasure that I introduce Jerry Post. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm introduction, Barbara. And the feelings are surely uh, mutual. What I'm going to do today is uh, sketch out uh, some of the thinking of, uh, well, over the years and trying to understand the mind of the terrorist. This goes back to the late 70s, and, and after the success of the Camp David Profiles, in fact, we were asked, this was during the epidemic of terrorism, that was getting, can you apply the same at a distance psychological assessment techniques to understanding terrorist psychology, the psychology of terrorist groups, the psychology of terrorist leaders, and we, uh, we volunteered to, to do that, and my group uh, uh, started pursuing that. This goes back to the uh, late 1970s. Now, when uh, President Bush uh, made that kind of rousing comment uh, after 9-1-1, this is the first war of the 21st century, uh, that was certainly very stirring to us all and gave images of a uh, an inevitable victory for the United States and uh, a surrender ceremony of the USS Missouri, but it was not only a bad metaphor, but it was historically uh, you know, inaccurate. The war has really been going on since the beginning of mankind, but the modern era is usually dated back uh, to uh, the late 60s, early 70s, with the famous icon of the uh, uh, Israeli Olympic Village at the Munich Olympics being taken hostage. Um, by radical Palestinian terrorists. And the reason that event is so important is uh, it informed other terrorist groups about the power of the media. So part of the modern era of terrorism has to do with the, uh, uh, the actual targeting of the media, who are not merely uh, um, bystanders in this, and they're active targets of manipulation, which becomes all the more effective for them in this era of 24-7 journalism. Uh, I'm putting down this definition, uh, which is substance-free. It's talking of terrorism as a methodology. Here, let's see another way of the screen. Uh, uh, and the second sentence is particularly important. A criminal act that is often symbolic, and indeed usually symbolic in nature, and intended to influence an audience beyond the immediate victim. So this is violence as communication. 
Uh, and the goal uh, is to reach a number of different audiences. There's a lot of sloppiness about terrorism definition. And I'm uh, regularly asked questions. I, I gave a presentation on terrorism to a graduating class of the Egyptian Foreign Service Academy who got up en masse, or half of them got up and talked about Palestinian terrorism. It was Israel who was the terrorists. Well, you can deploy some of the counter-terrorist techniques, but taking innocent lives in order to uh, obtain support for a goal, uh, however wonderful that goal is, uh, uh, I think we can all deploy. So we're talking about a methodology rather than something that is related to the particularity of the cause. And many of the causes I'll be talking about today are causes many of us in the audience, including myself, would embrace. So it's a method rather than, than, that, than that cause. Uh, a somewhat uh, obsessive compulsive colleague of mine working for the UN, Alex Schmidt, has a marvelous book on, uh, on uh, terrorism. And he systematically uh, uh, circularized 193 experts on terrorism, uh, collected their definitions, went through uh, features in common and boiled it down to a succinct 15-page uh, 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 single-space summary. Uh, this is my summary of his summary. Um, but uh, it, uh, it's, it's kind of important to understand, let me walk you through this. The target of the violence themselves is the innocent victim, non-combatants, such as the, uh, those working in the World Trade Center or passengers on Pan Am 103, the uh, uh, women and ch children in a pizza parlor uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Tel Aviv, uh, the innocent victims, the non-combatants. The target of terror is the members of that class. Uh, so when 9-11 um, uh, occurred, uh, the flying public uh, basically decided they'd, they'd rather uh, stay at home or take trains. Uh, and when Bin Laden, after that, sent out this kindly piece of advice to, uh, uh, like I said, his observant Muslims to not fly in planes and not uh, work in high-rise buildings, that was not designed uh, to be helpful to observant Muslims. The goal of that was to deprive our primary goal of terrorism to terrorize. Uh, and, and it was very effective. We wanted to sustain that terror. America cannot relax, he said, until there is justice for the Palestinian people, justice for Muslims, etc., etc. The target of compliance, uh, sometimes called extortionate terrorism, uh, is when terrorists uh, uh, say take uh, the uh, 847 skyjacking. You may remember about the early era of terrorism in Beirut. Uh, where the uh, TWA plane was, uh, was, was skyjacked. And the terrorists said, unless you, the United States, get Kuwait to release the Kuwaiti 7, uh, we will be uh, uh, killing American passengers on the plane. And they first killed Lieutenant Sletton. And an interesting example of the role of the media, in that the media are not merely reporters, but are active participants. BBC was reporting uh, that event, uh, uh, widely listened to, uh, not only in Europe, but in the, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, uh, I get this from a, a good friend of mine who knew the P PLO interlocutor in that event. And at one point, uh, after this one death, after many hours of the standoff, and so we were all fascinated, shut down regular programming um, on television uh, for days during this. BBC reported, there's reason to believe that soon uh, this terrorist event will end without further loss of life. There's reason to believe the terrorist will is slackening, and soon they will be giving up peacefully. Well, uh, the terrorists were listening to that. Our will is slackening, is it? We'll show them, and they threw another body out on the, uh, on the tarmac. So how the media behave actively affects the terrorist drama. That's, uh, terribly important to understand. So at another level, it's a very vicious species of psychological warfare waged through the media. And something I'll come to at the very end, if that is true, you don't counter psychological warfare with smart bombs and missiles. You counter with psychological warfare. And I'll be going through a program for uh, how you would counter psychologically terrorism in the, uh, in the long run, just to make this 
So they're not merely observers, but active targets of manipulation. In fact, the major terrorist groups have vice presidents for media relations. Uh, in the terrorist manuals that we've acquired, there will be a chapter usually on how to get maximal terrorist attention, including the timing of the event so as to coincide with the, uh, with the news cycle. So this is very well, uh, very well put out indeed. This you may remember, that was that uh, uh, dreadful image that was constantly on the, on the, on the TV screen during that TWA project in, in the early 70s. Uh, this makes the point in cartoon form, uh, but what really makes the point is this next cartoon. Uh, hello there, Ron, good to see you. Uh, a fellow shrink. Because, in fact, you don't have terrorism in, in, uh, in totalitarian societies. If the goal of terrorism is to terrorize, and you have to reach that outside audience, when you have a totally uh, controlled press, that audience won't be reached. If a tree falls in the forest, uh, and there's no one there to listen to it, does he make a sound, an old philosophical conundrum. Uh, if a terrorist act occurs and no one knows about it, it's a failed terrorist act. We didn't see terrorism in the Soviet Union until the era of Glasnost and Perestroika. Uh, began. So uh, this is this is quite. Uh, <coughs> this is that famous icon, which really dates the beginning of the modern era uh, of of terrorism. They had an audience of 2.5 billion television audience for those Olympics, and and it was then that not only the Palestinian terrorists but other terrorists realized the power of the media and what this could, uh, this could do for them. Now with that, uh, what kind of people? Uh, and this was the reason I, as a psychiatrist, had asked, look, how many people could possibly throw a bomb into a marketplace? This was during the War of the Bombs in Beirut, uh, killing innocent women and children. Obviously, no psychologically normal person could do that. It must be crazed uh, psychotic. So let me just briefly take you into the mind of the terrorist. Most terrorists, as individuals, are psychologically normal. Now, what I mean by normal is these are not crazed psychotics. They wouldn't, in the psychiatric language, fit into that section of our nomenclature uh, as being uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. In fact, it covers the whole, their, their personality is part of the entire range, but there are two types of personality which tend to be disproportionately attracted to the ranks uh, of, uh, of, of terrorism, especially for leadership. And it is the leadership which determines the psychology of the group. But I've become increasingly fascinated in understanding group organization and societal envelope in which the terrorists are acting rather than looking at them individually. So one type, kind of the sociopathic narcissist, uh, no empathy uh, for others, seeking excitement, uh, uh, action-oriented, but quite interestingly, angry paranoid. If you have uh, a group of individuals who are not succeeding in this life, uh, school dropouts, uh, not able to hold a job, uh, uh, isolated uh, interpersonally, what a terrific thing to have a group that says, it's not us, it's them. They are responsible for our problems. And then it becomes not only not unethical to hurt them, or not immoral to hurt them, it becomes a moral imperative, because if we get rid of them, we will get rid of the problems that are affecting our society slash my life. Uh, there is a tendency to externalize. Splitting mechanism return, uh, refers to what is generally true of, of, of terrorist uh, uh, language. We are all good, they are all bad. All the problems come from them. We have no responsibility. You don't have uh, the red brigade terrorists saying, well, you know, uh, the regime in Rome is uh, trying hard, but they've got this unfortunate structural anomaly where they're graduating many too many students for our, for our, our country to support. Uh, and we constantly have this, uh, this bloated um, workplace uh, with people who are underemployed. No, the, the uh, capitalist exploiters in Rome are making use uh, and, and, and exploiting the, uh, the working class workers of the world to rise. And this was part of the, uh, what was very stirring uh, to the, uh, the early days of social revolutionary terrorism. Now, this is a busy chart. Uh, but I put it up to talk about we are focused on radical Islamic terrorism in Bin Laden these days. Uh, it's uh, terrorism, we should really almost talk about terrorisms and terrorist psychologies. Plural. 
across the top uh, uh, in uh, reading in Hebraic style from right to left. Uh, and more alliteratively, we have crazies, criminals, and crusaders. Uh, uh, back again to the crazies. There are individuals who, who have committed acts for a cause, uh, but they are not permitted to be, in fact, in terrorist groups. Uh, terrorist groups expel emotionally unstable people or don't let them in in the first place. It, it would be a slur against them if an act occurred that was occurred by a crazy. Uh, secondly, there are security risks. You wouldn't have, a, a, you wouldn't have an emotionally disturbed person uh, in uh, the Green Berets. You wouldn't have them in the special operations group of a terrorist group. Criminal terrorism is blending into political terrorism in the Andean nations where the earlier social revolutionary terrorists of FARC, ELN, and so forth, now have become <coughs> narco-terrorists for the narco campaigns in return uh, for the financial benefits they have. They're able to sustain their organization. Many of them say, even though they still keep giving voice uh, to their Marxist-Leninist uh, uh, cant, uh, that in fact, uh, it has it's been a significant diminution in the revolutionary fervor, and they are now sustaining themselves through criminal activities. But we'll be focusing on political terrorism at the middle tier, again right from left, uh, uh, state terrorism refers to the circumstance when the state uses the powerful weapons of the state against its own citizens. A notorious example being the uh, uh, dirty wars in Argentina, where we had a new verb form for disappear. People getting disappeared by the government uh, who were opposed to the government. Everyone was being labeled a, a terrorist. Uh, anyone who uh, doesn't uh, support what we do is a terrorist who is on the side of terrorists. You may have heard some version of that after 911. Um, uh, another example of state terrorism uh, uh, would be Saddam Hussein himself against the Kurds with the, uh, with the poison gas uh, attack uh, against his own citizens. This would be state chemical terrorism. State supported terrorism, uh, every year there's a uh, a, a list put out by the Department of State. It's a great concern to the United States. This is the states uh, supporting terrorism um, in a variety of ways in order to attain their foreign policy objectives. And the usual residents of that list are Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, North Korea, Cuba, and uh, Sudan. Uh, Libya has finally won its release from that list by virtue of uh, of some of its, re of its recent moves and revealing its own programs of weapons of mass destruction. We'll be talking about it mainly on the psychology of sub-state terrorism. Across the bottom tier, I listed five groups. In the early era of terrorism, the two most prominent groups were the social revolutionary terrorists of the left, uh, the Bader Meinhof gang, uh, the Red Army faction, the Red Brigade, speak to Marxist-Leninist uh, rhetoric uh, uh, seeking uh, to reform a socialist uh, uh, state by undermining the, uh, uh, the capitalist imperialist conspiracy, and the national separatist terrorists of Fatah, the IRA, ETA in the Basque region of, uh, of Spain, uh, seeking a, a, their own uh, national, uh, uh, seeking an independent state uh, as a minority feeling dominated by, by, the, uh, by the state uh, at large. In that modern era of terrorism's beginning, everyone was competing for attention for their cause, and would often have multiple claims of responsibility uh, for an act. They wanted to influence the West, have an impact on the West, and if you think about it, that has interesting implications for weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. Most terrorist groups want to call attention to the West, to their system and inequities. Too much violence would be counterproductive for their cause. Uh, there is a startling exception to that, which I will be focusing on, and that's radical uh, uh, fundamentalist terrorism. Uh, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, there was a uh, a, a steep increase in, in, in actions by terrorist groups for which there was no uh, responsibility. <coughs> Why? These were the actions of, of radical fundamentalist terrorists who weren't seeking to influence the West, but to expel the West, uh, number one. But secondly, more importantly, uh, they were killing in the name of God 
So they didn't need the New York Times story or that CNN story because they were killing the name of God and God already knew uh, what, what they were doing. Right-wing terrorism sort of took off in some ways at the end of the Cold War. Well, let me give you a brief uh, theology lesson and then we'll dispense with right-wing uh, uh, terrorists because you may not be aware uh, just of some of the uh, peculiar ideology that has driven some of the right-wing uh, terrorists. This is from some of the documents uh, attributed to the Church of Jesus Christ Christian, uh, which is the uh, 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 terrorist, uh, which is the political wing for which the Aryan Nation is the main group. And at their summer retreats at Hyden Lake, uh, they would regularly bring in some of the more extreme um, militia groups. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Timothy McVeigh was very much steeped in their literature. Um, uh, in the beginning, um, uh, uh, when uh, uh, God, God created uh, Eden, uh, uh, Eve uh, made it with two. She made it with Adam, uh, who was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, uh, uh, from which came the Adamic race, uh, of which Christ was a member, uh, and it, this was the true chosen people, the Aryan nation. Uh, she also mated uh, with the serpent, which was the devil uh, in disguise. From this came the spawn of the devil in human form, the Jews, of which uh, Cain was the first representative. When Cain slew Abel, that was the prototype of the genocide of the white race that the Jews, the spawn of the devil, uh, were planning. However, uh, the Jews could not do that alone. And what you may not be aware of is Eden was not the first attempt uh, at creation. There was another attempt before Eden. God screwed up earlier, apparently. And from this came uh, a uh, what we call the mud people, blacks and people of color, uh, who were subhuman. Uh, and the Jews, the spawn of the devil, in control of the mud people, will be opposed to the true Aryan nation in the coming clash. So when these uh, weekend warriors are going down uh, uh, in, in engaging in paramilitary exercises. This is uh, not mere boys at play. They are preparing for the final struggle and are really steeped in this rhetoric, which, by the way, at these camps uh, in the uh, summer, uh, while the uh, parents are learning paramilitary techniques, their children are in day school uh, learning this poisonous rhetoric, which is preached from, from the uh, pulpit. Uh, Single-issue terrorism uh, emphasizes the point of uh, I was making earlier that many of the causes we would all be quite supportive of, even though the methodology of terrorism is deplorable. We have here animal rights terrorism, uh, the son of a, uh, uh, a noted biologist uh, in, uh, uh, in New York who won the Alaska Award for his uh, research on, uh, on diabetes uh, using animal subjects, uh, 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 married uh, you are a good friend of mine who told me uh, uh, this uh, story of the animal rights terrorist going out to his place in the Hamptons, his weekend uh, retreat, and firebombing it while he was inside. In order to preserve hum uh, uh, animal life, they were willing to take human life. He barely escaped. Now, there's something very strange about this, and part of my, uh, one of my aphorisms is the cause is not the cause. The cause of the justification, the rationalization, were frustrated, alienated individuals aiming, uh, guided in that aim by hate their leaders, their frustration at a particular uh, target. I used to have this religious fundamentalist terrorism on this chart, now I have religious extremist terrorism because uh, with the Aum Shinrikyo attack on uh, uh, the Tokyo subways with sarin, we had a, a, a a genuine terrorist attack, in this case, by a new, a new age terrorist group uh, 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 led by that interesting guru, uh, uh, Shoko Asahara. Aum Shinriko is a very peculiar group. We'll talk about them later. But So we have both new religions terrorism and religious fundamentalist terrorism. And let me say now, and I will say it again, when I talk about religious fundamentalist terrorism, the large majority of fundamentalists are perfectly peaceful. To be a fundamentalist is not to be a terrorist. And we see this in all of the great religions. 
Uh, we see both fundamentalist strands as well as religious belligerents within Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam. So we're not just talking about Islam. This is a generational matrix I developed a number of years ago. Down the left, the youth's relationship to their parents, where El is loyal, D is disloyal. Across the top, parents' relationship to the regime. L is loyal, D is uh, fortunately disloyal, damaged, or dissident. Um, what the upper left-hand cell says is that individuals who are at one with a family that is at one with the regime don't become terrorists. And there are two mirror images here. Uh, uh, in the right-hand cell are national separatist terrorists, so I'll talk about it some length in a few minutes, who are loyal to families who have been damaged by the regime or dissident to the regime. Uh, in the lower left, social revolutionary terrorists uh, who are carrying, who are fighting against a generation of their family uh, which is uh, associated with their regime. There's an interesting uh, uh, book, Hitler's Children, uh, talking about the uh, uh, Red Army Faction terrorists, Bader Maimo terrorists, and many of them in fact having connections to Nazi uh, parents. In case anyone asks, the lower right-hand cell I've sort of struggled with over the years. I've come to the conclusion uh, what it uh, represents is young conservative college children uh, of uh, flaming liberal parents left over from their 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would take it briefly through the social revolutionary terrorism. Their goal is to destroy the world of their fathers. Their acts of terrorism are acts of retaliation for real and imagined hurts against the society of their parents. They are symbolically dissenting against parents' loyal to the regime. We had a group in the United States, uh, the Weather Underground. Hello, I'm going to read a declaration of a state of war. Within the next 14 days, we will attack a similar institution of American injustice. That's from Bernadine Dorn. It was just a book that came out uh, just a couple of months ago uh, from the uh, uh, Bodine, uh, uh, a member of the group who just emerged uh, from prison called, I think, Family Circle, I believe, I believe it was called. Very interesting uh, group. We had uh, Patty Hearst, uh, you may recall, the uh, daughter of the publisher, who was a member, uh, and he was filmed carrying out uh, a bank of um, the Seminisa liberation army. But we had both Italy, the Red Brigades, the Red Army faction, quite military soldiers. They considered themselves a vanguard uh, in what a, uh, a colleague of mine, Franco Ferracuti, has uh, they, they considered themselves in a fantasy war with the establishment. And when the establishment then retaliated, as inevitably it must, against the group, it, it, it confirmed uh, that indeed they were important. They were uh, they were the vanguard of the revolution, and, and it was not a deterrence to them. Quite to the contrary. Uh, the Germans, in particular, studied uh, uh, their terrorists uh, quite thoroughly. Uh, a a 26-person interdisciplinary uh, team. And I had the opportunity of uh, interviewing 14 members of the team. Fractured families, 25% uh, who lost one or both parents by the age of 14. Job failure, school failure, 40% have been incarcerated for juvenile delinquency. And extreme interpersonal isolation. These were really loners. And the one place they felt they belonged was in this group. Uh, in fact, there was a kind of theory of the, uh, uh, of the terrorist group is really almost having the, the same psychology as a, uh, uh, as a youth gang perpetuating into, a, into, a, into, a, you know, into adolescence and in, in, uh, in use. What a fabulous thing if those are your characteristics, again, to be able to say, it's not us, it's them. They are the cause of our problems. So the cause is not the cause. The need, this need to belong produces very powerful group dynamics, which is true of all terrorist groups. And again, I want to emphasize this, it is the group, the organization, that is crucial, not the individual. Once a person is caught up in that group and is regularly being exposed to this very polarized rhetoric uh, and seeks, and, and especially for the underground group, which was the case with the social revolutionary terrorists, it's very powerful. Indeed. Lenin says the purpose of terrorism is to terrorize. Poe says the reason for becoming a terrorist is to belong to a terrorist group. Period. Let's go now to the national separatist terrorists, the uh, upper, upper right hand cell. 
They're carrying on the mission of their parents, their acts of terrorism or acts of retaliation for hurts done to their parents and grandparents by society. They are loyal to parents damaged by the regime, be it in the pubs in Northern Ireland or the coffee houses in, uh, in uh, Gaza and the occupied territories in Beirut. They have heard about the terrible things the regime has done to their family, stealing their land, depriving them of economic, uh, uh, economic goods. Uh, there's a three-generation uh, theory of the national separatist terrorism. The first generation has had the wound, the, uh, uh, the Armenian genocide, as an example. The second generation is in the coffee houses or the pubs, talking about it bitterly, about this having ruined their lives. The third generation saying it's time to stop talking and start, uh, uh, start acting. Um, some scenes from uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and let me uh, give you a TAT test uh, here. Um, what, do you, what do you see in this picture? That's, by the way, the green, the brick wall along the green line between the Protestant and Catholic sectors in Northern Ireland. What, what do you see here? Literally. Uh, a woman pushing a carriage and, and describe her. She looks very Right. Maybe, uh, maybe in that window at the back there's a figure, it's a little bit hard to tell. You see the rubble of warfare on the ground. What's in the big carriage? Could be a bomb, right. In fact, a colleague of mine, Seamus Thompson, has done an interesting study, what he called, he studied the headlines in uh, Times of London stories going back to 1850. Uh, and he talks about the genocidal spread, where at times it's been uh, just the security forces that are targets, but other times it's really just Catholic uh, uh, versus uh, Protestant. <coughs> but let's, uh, and in fact, in Northern Ireland, women have transported weapons in baby carriages for their brothers or husbands in the IRA. There's a group in Northern Ireland called Fiona, of uh, children, it's kind of like the Cub Scouts for the IRA, 9, 10, 11 year old kids who have transported <coughs> weapons again. What does it mean? Uh, those of us interested in developmental psychology, you know, there's some controversy over playing with violent toys. Some would say there's a sense of mastery. What, would, what happens though when it isn't toys, but it's actually the weapons of war, uh, isn't there a dulling of the meaning of, uh, of, of using these violent, not toys, but, but, but the real thing? We don't have to go to the Northern Ireland and talk about that. We can talk about the uh, ghettos of Washington, D.C., or Chicago, or Detroit, or, or, or Boston. But let's take a more benign view of this. It's a baby uh, there. What does it mean to be uh, nursing a, an infant on the mother's milk of fear, bitterness, uh, anxiety, and consumed by revenge? How can that child possibly grow up without having deep scars psychologically. I went to a, a fascinating seminar uh, during the first intifada at Barzait University in the uh, West Bank uh, on the psychological impact on children of the intifada. This was all Palestinian child psychiatrists or child psychologists, each of whom had been trained in either British or American institutions, so really very well educated uh, professionals. And one woman, I remember in particular, was talking about the empowerment of the Intifada. Uh, and what a wonderful thing it was for the Palestinian children to be able to throw stones against the um, enemy. They were having a sense of power, empowerment, uh, a sense of finally standing tall against the enemy. Of course, it was true uh, there was a high incidence of bedwetting and no respect for parents or, or teachers. But what a wonderful thing this was for them. Um, and I was oh, they're foolish enough to raise my hand and say, gee, we're all interested in you know, personality development in this room. What does it mean when the personality is still in a state of flux, uh, that one is rewarding violence as a way of dealing with conflict, and when rewarding the undifferentiated enemy as the source of all problems? Aren't we guaranteeing the uh, generational transmission of hatred, uh, hence the uh, subhead for my lecture topic of when hatred is bred in the bone. And at this point, the uh, psychologist switched off and the Palestinians switched on. She said, not to worry. Uh, when our people have the social and economic justice they deserve, all hatred will disappear. 
Well, you all laugh, it's so evidently foolish, but in, in fact, it's quite, uh, uh, it, uh, the laughter is, is about the fact that when you have taught kids to hate from early on, you have a very powerful and painful legacy, and part of the reason the so-called war on terrorism is going to take generations uh, to, to uh, prosecute, to change some of these quite deep-seated attitudes. Here's an example. Uh, this uh, is in Northern Ireland. Uh, I don't know what that boy is, maybe eight years old, uh, nine. Uh, you're going to see a future IRA fighter uh, in, in, in that image. The signing of the Good Friday Accords will not put an end to this deeply seated and culturated attitudes within him that the cause of all our problems are them. This is a summer exercise of the Palestinian Authority summer camp for kids. Now, when I went to camp, our final uh, uh, thing was the uh, capture the flag. Uh, I said, I'm sure that's true for many of you, uh, uh, too. Their final exercise is to have the kids dress up in ski masks uh, 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 and to attack the mock Israeli Defense Force military outpost in the camp. And the person who was able to kill the, uh, the, um, the mock um, uh, Israeli soldier there in that outpost uh, wins the banner for his book. So this is socially sanctioned conditioning here, what a heroic thing it is. And, and, uh, and I, I must say, I find myself increasingly focusing on not the leadership here, well, the leadership who is putting these programs in place, but how deeply seated we are seeing these attitudes, age five, six, eight years old, kill the Jews, kill the Imperials, kill the kill the Americans throughout the Islamic world. Now, I uh, had a really interesting project, which uh, was fit. actually I got the page proofs, uh, not page proofs, the uh, final translations back just weeks before 911. in fact. Uh, this was, I had this kind of peculiar idea uh, uh, that maybe the best way to find out what makes terrorists tick was to ask them, which really there's been very little interviews of them about terrorists. Uh, and got sponsorship from the Smith Richardson Foundation and with a, an Israeli team of interviewers um, uh, who I had spent considerable time training. They were retired Mossad interrogators um, and uh, their way of interviewing was rather different than the one I was trying to foster. Um, but I, what I basically taught them how to do, uh, here were people who were going to be in prison for many life sentences. Uh, uh, was, uh, I wanted them to uh, play to their egos um, and help them make sense of what they did. We got many of them to be really taught with some pride of what they had accomplished. And once they started doing that, could talk about how they got into the group. Uh, very interesting information on their parents' attitude about political violence, uh, their parents, what the parents had taught them, uh, the group dynamics within the group. Quite fantastic information, really. A couple of quotes. I belong to the generation of, we, we have 14 secular nationalist terrorists and 21 religious fundamentalist uh, terrorists who uh, were all in Palestinian or Israeli uh, prisons. I belong to the generation of occupation. My family are refugees from the 1967 war. The war and my refugee status were the seminal events that formed my political consciousness and provided the incentive for doing all I could to help regain our legitimate rights in our occupied country. But like, these are direct quotes from taped or, or taped transcripts uh, where you're going to be seeing, I think, what you'll be persuaded is very normal, sensible enemies. They're not crazy individuals. Uh, as a youth, I remember seeing devastating pictures of the occupier's conduct. For example, how a border police patrol entered the vegetable market in Davos and delivery turns over stores. Enlistment was for me the natural and done thing, in a way it can be compared to a young Israeli from a national Zionist family who wants to fulfill himself through national service. And it's really very interesting. I was uh, talking to a colleague who teaches in the law school of each uh, up here at Harvard, each fall, Ariel Mararik from Tel Aviv University, really a member of that little mafia you know, who's been working together for probably 30 years now. He said, you know, it was very interesting. He was here. Uh, watching the fever for the uh, Patriots uh, uh, last fall, uh, and, uh, uh, and was struck at how similar but how different Palestinian youth are 
uh, from American. American youth idolize National Football League heroes, American National Basketball Association heroes. They'll be talking together uh, when they're having their ice cream sodas and, and about wanting to be this when they grow up. Palestinian kids, he said, are just the same. Over the ice cream sodas, they're gossiping too about their heroes, the Shahids, the martyrs, uh, and, gossip, and talking about how they're almost competing with each other, how that's what they want to be when they grow up. So we have normal adolescent psychology, which, however, has really quite different hero <laughs> figures. So in my, my motivation in joining Fatra was both ideological and personal. It was a question of self-fulfillment, of honor, and a feeling of independence. The goal of every young Palestinian was to be a fighter. And in fact, when we interviewed them, when we were asking them why they joined, we got these peculiar looks. We talked about everybody was joining. After recruitment, my social status was greatly enhanced. I got a lot of respect from my acquaintances and young people in the village. And that's a distinction with the group dynamics of these social revolutionary terrorists who are an underground group. Here, they are known within the community, and their families and they are given great uh, support for this, uh, for this section. Recruits were treated with great respect. A youngster who belonged to Hamas or Fatah was regarded more highly than one who didn't belong. Anyone who didn't enlist during that period of the First Intifada would have been ostracized. This, uh, as a court case, I became involved in with the Department of Justice in uh, uh, 1997, uh, tried in federal court in Washington. An Abu Nidal terrorist, who in many ways uh, uh, almost epitomizes the, the history of some of these uh, people. Uh, uh, he was uh, in charge of the terrorist mission to skyjack an Egypt airplane. They were down over Malta. There was a standoff. And in the ensuing SWAT team attack, 55 people got killed in this box. It was a dreadful event. Malta, after having him in jail for murder for seven years, released him because it was a political crime, uh, which was quite terrific. Uh, but we had an interesting issue of double jeopardy. He was then, uh, through the uh, doctrine of extraterritoriality, uh, which we may or may not approve of, was then snatched by the FBI and couldn't be tried for murder, was tried for skyjacking, which was a federal crime. Um, in the 1948 war, his mother was eight years old at that time, uh, and they were living in Jaffa, the Islamic counterpart of Haifa, right in the heart of Israel, uh, and were forced to flee and went to the West Bank, her grandparents' farm. There they lived a rather idyllic uh, life until 1967, when our terrorist-to-be, uh, Mohammed Reza, uh, uh, was eight years old. And then the 67 war occurred, and they were forced to flee, now ending up in, in a refugee camp in Jordan. At this point, his mother says to young Reza, you heard about this before, this is the second time this has happened to me. First, we lost our home in, in, in Jaffa. Now we're losing our home in the uh, West Bank. When he went uh, uh, to, into, the, into Jordan, there were schools provided with UNESCO funding, and he was taught by a PLO teacher who was a member of Fatah. Uh, the reputation of Arafat was powerful at that time. Uh, and was circulating around, and he was taught the only way to become a man is to join the revolution and help regain and restore the land stolen from your parents and grandparents. Um, he had, from age nine on, reading, writing, arithmetic in the morning, and paramilitary techniques in the, uh, in the afternoon. When he took over, when he finally went from violent group to ever more violent group, and ended up in the Abu Naidal group, and went uh, and, and carried out this mission, it was, for him, the fulfillment of his lifelong dream. He was finally doing something to, to, to win back his parents' uh, uh, territories, those parents and, and uh, grandparents. And just to give you a flavor for the psychology of, of, of these individuals, I still have the short hairs in the back of my neck stand up on end when I, when I think of this interview. He was explaining to me, um, it was kind of like a military debriefing, uh, almost. He was explaining to me uh, the impasse that had occurred. He had very good English uh, by this time. Uh, he said, so we were stuck, uh, doctor. Uh, uh, and uh, I told them uh, they needed to be refueled in Malta to go on to Libya. Uh, and I told them we would only release the hostages when uh, there were, uh, uh, when we had been refueled. They, foolish people, said, 
we will only refuel you after you release the hostages. So I was told I had to make them take me seriously, and that the first people to kill were the Jews. And I went through the passports, and I found the passports of two Israeli uh, women. And I had the porter bring back one of them to me, and I grabbed her hair in my left hand, put a revolver to her head, and said, I'm about to kill an Israeli woman passenger. Uh, and they, foolish people, said, we will not give you fuel uh, until you release the hostages. So I blew her brains out. But then I was getting rather hungry, uh, and I asked the porter for some lunch. And he brought me a pita sandwich. It was very nice. Uh, uh, and uh, I thought then, surely they would take me seriously. I said, well, I've killed one Israeli woman. Are you going to give us fuel? We told you, foolish people, they said, we told you we are not going to give you uh, any fuel until you release the hostages. So, and I interrupted her at this point. Oh, that's what I said. So I, I grabbed her hair in my left hand, put the revolver to it, her head, and I stopped him at this point. I said, how did it feel killing a woman? And he then explained to me, it's like a mantra kind of, oh, well, it was explained to me that in Israel, both men and women join the military, therefore both men and women uh, are the enemy, therefore they both deserve to die. And he said, and then I blew her brains out, then the next class of enemies to, uh, to shoot was uh, Americans, uh, and hence getting into an American court. And after the fifth American was shot in the head, uh, they then stormed the uh, plane. But, but it was the matter of factness and the pride and the fact that these were not, and the dehumanization to the, the enemy uh, whom, whom he was killing his weren't people. He had no discernible reactions. With that, let me uh, shift to uh, religious fundamentalist terrorism. And some of this will uh, duplicate uh, for those of you who were there yesterday, part of what we talked about yesterday. Um, and I will uh, move swiftly through this and then spell out in a little more depth than I did yesterday the implications for, uh, for counterterrorism. Killing the name of God. Um, it's kind of interesting when you think about it to have religious authorities extolling the virtues of killing. Um, it turns out if you, if you trace the etymology of the commandment, uh, uh, thou shalt not kill, it really should be thou shalt not murder. And in each of the texts, the Quran, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, there are circumstances when killing is not only allowed, uh, but it, is, uh, it becomes a sacred uh, obligation. It's certainly particularly true in the Quran, but uh, uh, I'll give you a verse from the Old Testament in just a moment. Uh, while bin Laden uh, is a Wahhabi uh, Sunni, uh, and Khomeini uh, is Shia, of course, uh, it is the, some of the same ambiguous verses from the Quran that uh, Khomeini simply <coughs> justify his acts of violence uh, that, that bin Laden has, uh, has singled out. Rabin, uh, it was said, was uh, that in killing Rabin, Amir, uh, the Jewish fundamentalist terrorist, in effect, uh, killed peace. And is, uh, is, uh, it may well be, uh, well, may well be true. Uh, Amir was very proud of what he had done and boasted that he had to do this because, according to the radical rabbinate in Israel, the judgment of the pursuer had been fashioned to Rabin. That goes back to a verse uh, in Leviticus. Thou shalt not stand idly by thy brother's innocent blood, which in effect says if your brother is being pursued by a killer, uh, you must kill the killer in order to save your innocent brother. And through the Oslo Accords, by putting a group of terrorists in the very borders of Israel, uh, bin La uh, uh, Rabin was in effect uh, joined the ranks of the pursuers and was threatening the lives of, of Israeli citizens and deserved to die. The army of God, who will rise up for me against the evildoers, or who will stand up for me against the workers of inequity, bombing uh, abortion clinics, killing uh, physicians who uh, perform abortions, nurses, healthcare <laughs> workers. Whether one is pro-life or pro-choice, and I'm sure we have uh, both sentiments represent here, we can all not only abhor, but also be perplexed by taking human life in order to preserve human life. Uh, Bishop Troche, who's been excommunicated and was extolling violence against uh, abortion clinic personnel, gave the following kind of seductive uh, psychological. Uh, if you were walking down the main street of Auschwitz-Birkenau 
and you came across Dr. Mengele, one of the perpetrators of the Holocaust, uh, and you uh, uh, killed him, uh, would you be a murderer? No, you'd be a hero for impeding the work uh, of the Holocaust. A Holocaust is being visited on the unborn children of this nation. Anyone who kills a doctor, a nurse, or a healthcare worker in one of these clinics uh, that, that, that help contribute to this Holocaust is not, a, uh, is not a murderer. They are a hero and deserve our reverent admiration. There's a kind of persuasive black and white logic to that, uh, um, which indeed many of his followers uh, went into. Alan Shinrikyo. Fascinating man, uh, Shoko Asahara, uh, not only uh, uh, was quite powerful with his, uh, his cult, but he was actively recruiting at the PhD level molecular biologists, microbiologists, virologists, inorganic chemists, organic chemists, nuclear physicists, and also recruiting nuclear engineers, pursuing all three weapons of mass destruction uh, uh, programs uh, simultaneously, and belief in science is one of the indicators, by the way, when a group is moving uh, from conventional terrorism to uh, weapons mass destruction terrorism, who's being recruited? Uh, this was totally beneath the screen internationally, but it was a protected religious group. He also had a kind of high-tech way uh, of guaranteeing the security of the group. It was the uh, 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 Aum Shinrikyo was kind of like a roach hotel. It was easy to get in, but you couldn't get out. Uh, and when this couple tried to uh, defect, uh, he had an industry-sized microwave oven, and when they captured them, they were incinerated, uh, medium rare, uh, in the um, in the microwave size, uh, in the industry-sized microwave oven, which seriously concentrated the attention of other potential defectors. Mm -hmm. Fundamental differences between religious fundamentalist terrorism and other terrorisms. Other terrorisms are interested in influencing contemporary society. Fundamentalist religious terrorism wishes no dialogue with contemporary society, wishes to eliminate modernizing influences, and in particular, radical Islamist terrorism seeks to eliminate Western presence and influence. They are hierarchical and authoritarian, so there's an absence of conflict, because these people have had a religious authority say, what we are going to do is God's will, and they are the authentic interpreters of, uh, of the... Uh, of the uh, holy work, be it Quran, uh, Old Testament, or New Testament. At the age of 16, I developed an interest in religion, was exposed to the Muslim Brotherhood. The mosques and the religious clerics in my village provided the focal point of my social life. Um, I'll go through these fairly swiftly so we can have some uh, time for questions. But just note, the Sheikh used to inject some historical backgrounds which would tell us how we were effectively evicted from Palestine. The Sheikh also used to explain to us the significance of the fact that there was an Israeli Defense Force um, military outpost in the heart of the camp. He compared it to a cancer in the human body which was threatening to its very existence. That's language out of the Holocaust world. Now, in the Quran, there is a strict proscription against suicidal terrorism. Whoever kills himself with an iron weapon, and the iron weapon will remain in his hand, he will continually stab himself in the belly with it in the fire of hell, eternally and forever and ever. No ambiguity there. In talking with the suicide bomb commanders whom we had the opportunity of interviewing, uh, one of them got very indignant uh, when we asked the question, given you say this in the name of Allah, uh, how can you say that when the Quran proscribes suicide? When you're talking about suicide terrorism. This is not suicide. Suicide is weak, it is selfish, it is mentally disturbed. This is istashad, which is martyrdom or self-sacrifice in the service of Allah. This first quote is from a, 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 the uh, Hassan Salome, probably the most prolific uh, Palestinian terrorist responsible for the overthrow, many would say, of the Shimon Peres regime and bringing Netanyahu to power. Uh, his, his wave of terrorism, the run-up to the 1996 election, Representing not something like 75 deaths, he was convicted of 46 of them, uh, for which he's now serving 46 consecutive life terms. A suicide bombing is the highest level of jihad and highlights the depth of our faith. The bombers are holy fighters who carry one of the more important articles of faith. I note in this long quote something that is remarkably normal sounding, kind of chilling. Uh, this is someone not as prolific as Hassan Salah. I remember that beside the tremendous respect I had for Halil, 
and the fact that I was jealous of him, I also felt slighted that he had not asked me to be the third suicide bomber. Very remarkable statement, I mean, I, I think, the kind of uh, not being chosen for a pickup team. Um, no moral red lines. In the jihad, there are no red lines. What I'm going to do now, briefly, is to contrast the Israeli suicide bombers with the 9-11 suicidal hijackers, who are different in my judgment. 17 to 22, uh, uh, uneducated, unemployed, unmarried young men, although that is changing. Uh, we now see women carrying this out. We've had a father of three, a uh, father of six, carry out one of, uh, one of these uh, acts. It's becoming deeper and more in the society. But at the time these uh, suicidal autopsies were conducted, this was a general finding. The most important, they're kept under tight control once they volunteered themselves or, or, or were selected because of their reputation. Uh, they were never let out uh, of, the, uh, of the safe house until they were physically escorted to the scene of, of the shopping mall or, 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 or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, this was to guard against backsliding. Remarkable contrast with the September 11th terrorists, whom I see as fully formed adults, who, however, are true believers of the cause of radical Islam as articulated by the destructive charismatic leader Osama bin Laden. Late 20s to early 30s, 28 to 33, with the exception of a few late add-ons for muscle. Some higher education, bin Laden, I mean, Atta and his colleagues when he, uh, were actually uh, in graduate school in Hamburg. Comfortable middle class backgrounds in Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Interestingly, on their own in the West for upwards of seven years, lending in with society, uh, exposed to all the temptations of this uh, blessing, bloody, buzzing, blooming confusion of a democracy uh, we live in, and seeing uh, temptations but opportunities too, no stereotype, they were here, uh, and yet carrying within them like a laser beam while they're blending in uh, the, uh, uh, the goal of taking thousands of lives while giving them their own lives. They were accused of being hypocrites. Uh, they weren't bearded. They weren't seen praying, they weren't seen fasting. What kind of Muslims uh, were these? Um, and in fact, there's a verse in the uh, Al Qaeda terror, or there's a lesson in the Al Qaeda terrorism manual, which basically explains the fact that when you're in the land of the enemy, you must resemble the enemy, and Allah will forgive you uh, for not living up to the, uh, uh, to the commandments of how to be a good Muslim. Uh, because what you're doing is in the service of Allah, is in the service of Islam. I'm struck by this Al-Qaeda training manual of dedication, uh, which uh, reflects the, char the charismatic leadership of bin Laden and his deputy, uh, Zawahiri. The confrontation with calling for the apostate regimes does not know Socratic debates, platonic ideals, or Aristotelian diplomacy, but knows the dialogue of bullets, the ideals of assassination, bombing and destruction of diplomacy of the cannon and the machine gun. And note the last line of this turning point jihad from uh, bin Laden. We with God's help call on every Muslim who believes in God and wishes to be rewarded, that is to go to paradise, to comply with God's order to kill the Americans. Not bin Laden's order, God's order. I've discussed this with a moderate Muslim cleric, so it's a blasphemy, because he is talking as if he is the new prophet and he has an authentic new interpretation, the notion that God would command the killing of all Americans. Uh, uh, but to these true believers, this is what is being um, communicated. Okay, with that, let me just swiftly go through implications for counterterrorism. If this is psychological warfare, terrorism, you don't counter this with smart bombs and missiles, you counter with psychological warfare. And what does that mean? These are the uh, four elements of a program, in my judgment. I'll go through those. So keep them from getting in, uh, create dissension in the group, facilitate them getting out, reduce support for the group. Deromanticize de terrorists, provide alternate pathways to address grievances, reform education. Now those are big, long, complicated programs. Barbara and I were talking about this yesterday. Having said that, they are programs that need to be put in place. We have major reductions in our aid budget, 
uh, how can we work with some of these societies who are quite happy to see the anger deflect the United States, but who are themselves threatened because the education uh, is indeed producing a group that cannot, uh, cannot succeed uh, and are striking out uh, in, in despair. The education is also a teaching a very virulent brand of, uh, of Islam, says the West is out to destroy uh, Islam. Example of the hero worship of the uh, young terrorists. Promote dissension in the group. The underground group is a, is a pressure cooker. Uh, and, uh, and can we figure out some ways of having them explode or implode rather than directing all of their aggression outwards? I think this is complicated, but it's possible. Most importantly, how do we break the tie between leader and followers? There's data from terrorists who have left groups, in fact, uh, that is disillusioned with the leader uh, and not having him representing the high principles that they thought they were involved with when they got started. Encourage terrorists to leave the group. Amnesty programs have been used very successful by the Italians, uh, the Basques, uh, uh, and, and the British in, uh, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And finally, and most importantly, reduce support for the group and its leaders. Right now, Bin Laden's a romantic hero. In fact, he has no religious credentials. He is misinterpreting regularly uh, the Quran and justifying acts which the Quran proscribes. How can we mobilize Muslim, we can't do this ourselves, Muslim moderates, which is a large majority, uh, to be taking on uh, his uh, distortion of the Quran. How can we marginalize the group rather than make it a group of people are lining up in droves to join? So these are the kind of elements I'd like to suggest. And in doing that, at a cautionary note here, you can't eliminate terrorism without eliminating democracy. Uh, because to eliminate terrorism means we become a terrorist state, such as happened in uh, Argentina. So the goal is to reduce the frequency of terrorism so as to, uh, as little as possible, interfere with our open Western way of life, but to take anyone who is opposed to the administration and label him a terrorist and lock him up in jail without resource to courts uh, is something many of us have concerns about. On that slightly political note, I will stop. Uh, any, uh, uh, any, any questions? Yes. I'm just wondering, when you're working with the terrorists, do you find um, that there's any eroticization of the violence? That there's a birth. There at least is one, one example. And I, there are other examples before, and Jessica has some interesting interview material that I could probably collaborate on. It. I wouldn't make that as a widespread generalization. In general, I think part of what I'm trying to communicate is we're talking about a highly, increasingly valued social behavior, which is valued by the group. So these are not individuals on the periphery. Now what attracts some to the extremity of this behavior versus others? Does that contribute? Uh, for some it probably does. Yeah. Okay. I'll be on the Bibles side. Is it possible that by you know, encouraging totalitarian and dictatorial regimes in the Islamic countries, particularly in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, which is known as the or, or uh, Egypt, or is it the state of USA? The Saudis will, will, will tell you that this is the state of USA, the first state of USA. Or the Europeans will say this is the backyard of USA. Now, by you know encouraging totalitarian or dictatorial royals in those countries, are you not encouraging young men to express their dissension to an extreme measure? Um, yes. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, uh, back again to my first uh, uh, bullet, inhibiting uh, young men from joining the groups in the first place, we really have kind of had a devil's compact in some ways with several of these countries. Uh, there's a virulently anti-West media in Egypt, for example. Uh, we're giving them, what, $2.5 billion a year in aid I should think we'd have some leverage to say, uh, by the way, sir, we would appreciate you not appoint, and the, the appointment of the editors is entirely within the hands of Mubarak. Uh, we would appreciate it if uh, you would use your good influence to select web, uh, editors who wouldn't be portraying, who wouldn't be fostering this climate of violence. Uh, Saudi Arabia, 15 of the 19 uh, hijackers uh, were, of course, 
uh, Saudis, is, uh, they are supporting the radical madrasas financially, and Pakistan was only when terrorism hit them themselves that they are beginning to get uh, engaged, and again, I think it was kind of, kind of a devil's compact, and I think part of our diplomacy is they are as threatened, if not more so, than the United States. And we are really not the primary target. The primary target is the so-called, quote, apostate leaders of these countries who are not totally having a, a theocratic uh, uh, rule, and, uh, and they need to, uh, and the steps uh, uh, that uh, I've been sort of suggesting in terms of opening up these societies, their economies, their education, are ones really which will help them sustain in leadership. And they, I think our diplomacy has to work much harder at fostering that. Quite totally agree with you. Yes, all right. Well, a couple of questions. One is, uh, it was easy to see when you were talking about political terrorism or national separatism. Uh, it was easy to see when you were talking about national separatist terrorism, uh, the connection to the family and the loyalty to the uh, the loyalty to the parents and the injustices of, uh, of the family in previous generations. Uh, connect for me then when you move to religious terrorism, which really does have a polit seems like it has a strong political overlap. Um, but Bin Laden doesn't seem to be uh, uh, owned by his family. So there's a complex... In fact, he's disowned his family, and he's disowned by them. So there's a complex loyalty or disloyalty. So I'd like you to comment on the psychology there. The second thing is, those of us of a more politically liberal persuasion tend to look at terrorism and see poverty and humiliation, which is, I think, wrong. Not that there isn't poverty and humiliation, but there's a lot more poverty and humiliation in the world than there is terrorism. And it seems to me that it, the, the key missing ingredient is grandiosity as a, as a, as a, a frequent uh, um, effect of traumatic experiences or family traumatic. But that the grandiosity itself is ideological and theological and has strong roots in it. Uh, so if we if we address terrorism as a problem of poverty and humiliation, that leads to very different um, policies than if we address terrorism as a problem of grandiosity in which one has to stand up to grandiosity in order to deflate it. Well, those are two excellent so if questions. You could help me think through both. On the first question, uh, in my need separation of national separatist terrorism from uh, religious fundamentalist terrorism, it's really not so neat as that. Uh, in fact, A, uh, the national separatist terrorists, uppercase, uh, we now have them moving into martyrdom operations, and many of them are Muslims. So I see the national separatist, the Oxford Martyrs Brigade, as being uppercase national separatist, lowercase religious uh, in origin. Moreover, as some of the quotes uh, for the religious fundamentalist terrorists, talked about how the sheikh used to inject how we were spelled it. So they're kind of upper, uppercase religious, lowercase national separatists. On the second point, I wouldn't talk to grandiosity so much as, as, the, uh, uh, as the main title in the uh, center, which uh, Barbara helped bring here to the uh, uh, Kennedy School of Leadership, that when you have discontented individuals, uh, that leadership by a hate-mongering leader can be pointed and mobilized. But in fact, your point about poverty is a very important one. I was at an experts meeting in, uh, um, in Oslo last summer, helping prepare a white paper on the roots of terrorism uh, for UN General Assembly. And in fact, there is no statistical data on relationship with poverty. There are countries rife with poverty where there's no terrorism. And then there are extremely wealthy individuals who become involved. That you know, Osama bin Laden inherited $57 million on his 16th birthday, no poor person he. Uh, so uh, the, that, that is really, uh, uh, if all we have to do as the United States is, uh, is give our abundant uh, riches to help make the uh, world uh, one where there's no societal inequity and terrorism and all that will disappear. Having said that, uh, in the countries where there is a great deal, where there are terrorists, uh, 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 groups acting, 
in the deprived, alienated individuals is an abundant reservoir to draw upon for the next generation of terrorists. And the more these societies can be helped to be opened up, have more moderate, more modern educations, the less we will have that reservoir of, of supply, and the less vulnerable they'll be to the messages of hatred from their hate Sir. Suicide bombing in modern times began in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, did the liberation targets of Tamil Elam fit the same profile of the Palestinian suicide bombers? So we're talking about a non-Islamic, right. non, non the fundament, fundamentalist group, uh, starting long before the, the right. And in fact, also also the uh, PKK. Uh, has abundantly made use of suicide bombs. And moreover, in both of those countries, uh, women were, in, were dominant um, among the ranks. I, I, uh, it's an excellent question, which I hope with foundation support to be able to answer. I've got a proposal for uh, uh, going forth even as we speak, which I have some interest on. Uh, we're talking about how you counter suicide terrorism, but we have not really understood who these people are, what drives them, and also how they are recognized. So I've got a, a, a cross-cultural project to looking at Sri Lankan suicide terrorists, PKK, Chechnya too. You have the the, uh, the uh, black widows, the uh, the women in uh, uh, in Chechnya too. Jerry, the important point is the one is religious and one isn't suicide. And yeah, what's religion? Uh, 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 religion with a lowercase r is characteristic, I would suggest, of the Tamil Tigers, who have really a charismatic leader in the devotion to him and what he commanded uh, really uh, uh, had almost religious force. So uh, uh, if we use religion in a broader sense in terms of the kind of true believers in the cause uh, that has Roman's religious characteristics. This gets to Ron, Ronnie's point of, uh, about grand, grandiosity. It's difficult to appeal in the situation. Well, by the way, I wasn't meaning to uh, knock out your your grandiosity. I'm just saying it's part of larger. But we have messianic, narcissistic leaders who then have uh, are being idolized by their true believer followers, which adds to their own feeling around the on the uh, on the on the path of, of God or on the uh, uh, or on their own religion, like uh, like Shoko Asahara, who became. Uh, his own religious figure, but uh, but I, I think that's exactly accurate. And the the issue about true believers is they don't question because their godlike figure, be it a religious figure or a secular figure, uh, has told them this is the right thing to do. Yes, you, you talked about the path that uh, people may go through on a journey from from childhood experiences to terrorists, uh, but I'm also interested in the path that may happen from there. Um, some examples of groups that, well, not I don't want to claim that they're terrorist groups, but that went through a violent stage, uh, like, for example, even the American Revolutionary Generation, or Yagun, uh, moved to another stage. So I'm interested in, uh, are there certain kinds of people or certain kinds of situations that facilitate that, or are there kinds of people or situations that really preclude that from happening? Or in Northern Ireland, uh, bringing Sinn Féin into the political process. When there can be legitimate political representation for a sentiment. This is one of the pathways. The Greens there were ecological terrorists in the beginning and then became accepted as a legitimate uh, uh, political party. The examples you give are, are excellent ones. To turn that slightly upside down, when there is a group or a party uh, or a sentiment that can find no way of being expressed legitimately, uh, it, will, it will be expressed, but illegitimately. When you can give them a legitimate platform, that will dry up this. This is the reason the spider being so threatened by terrorism. There's been very little terrorism in the United States because there's so many uh, opportunities for legitimate uh, uh, dissent and gi giving voice to uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, sentiments they are. So you really have to be very extreme to be driven <coughs> in underground. In, in that order. So I, I, that is, uh, Martha Crenshaw's, that's very interesting work on how terrorism ends, and that is one of the pathways, finding a way of incorporating the group into the legitimate political system. Any thoughts on how that could be included in American foreign policy as a way to respond to this? Uh, oh. 
how who how who can be uh, included. How, how some of those ideas about uh, um, oh the ideas yeah uh, <coughs> sure lots of ideas <laughs> but uh, you make uh, you make a broader point uh, which is how important it is in whatever is going on domestically that every word is being heard and it's terribly important that the words being spoken are resonating in an international audience and that we need to have an inclusive rather than an exclusive rhetoric and finding ways of, uh, of conveying the values we stand for rather than the rather distorted portrayal of our values that comes out through some of the Middle Eastern media, uh, for example, I think is, uh, and in fact, I think that is not just an interesting idea, I think that should be the primary battle we should be of fighting uh, how to counter some of the exaggerated versions of who the United States is, what we stand for, uh, and the values which we hold beyond MTV and McDonald's. <laughs> yes? Yeah, you mentioned earlier that, and I think most would agree that the large majority of Muslims don't necessarily support the kind of terrorism that we've been seeing. But yet one of the complaints that's been leveled a lot is that you don't hear much comment from them, in particularly speaking out against it. At least recently I haven't heard a lot. And I'm just wondering what your take is on that or your thoughts are with regard to comments. Well, A, they have to be energized. I think this needs to be a major goal of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, domestic and foreign policy to energize moderate Muslim political leaders and religious leaders to take on really quite small minority within Islam. Having said that, that's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Palestinian territories, every time there was a moderate Palestinian mayor, he was getting knocked off by the power. And moderation is the enemy of extremism. Uh, and uh, I heard Hannah Shawri, uh, who I was seated with at the session I described at Barzai University, say the other day, uh, or a couple months ago after a, uh, a particularly brutal uh, a, a, a terrorist act, when she was asked to comment on it, said, surely you Americans who extol the heroism of Nathan Hale would understand the sweetness of giving your life for a cause. I didn't hear anyone question her about what about the sweetness of body parts of innocent children, though, littered about. One can be for the cause without doing this, but it's really dangerous to be a moderate now, and, and that's one of the alarming aspects of the directions currently from my point of view. Because there was, I think in Israel there was something like a 70 percent of uh, the population desperately being seeking uh, and being willing to give up territory uh, uh, for peace and security. And uh, I think it was upwards of 60 percent of the Palestinian population. You know, that moderate middle has increasingly gone to the extremity and both sides are feeling a uh, sense of bitterness about their righteous anger against the other, and, and uh, it's going to need, take a lot of work to, to, to bring them together. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> taking the Israel-Palestine conflict as a more of a case rather than just looking at that, what's the, uh, maybe the psychological reaction to Israeli responses to, to the targeted killing, the Israeli targeted killings of Palestinian leaders, um, of recently of Hamas? What does that do to the psychology of those terrorist groups? Does it, and people in general, does it embolden them for more support, like we hear many times, or does it, like other people on the other side say, it uh, reduces those terrorist acts? What's well, I think the, the clear answer to that is yes and no. Um, <laughs> uh, on the one hand, there's definitely been damage to leadership ranks. On the other hand, you're creating martyrs too, and I and I'm kind of being used by. Uh, uh, U.S. government criticism of this, when we've been complaining about why with our unmanned drones we haven't been able to identify and, uh, and nail a, a bit lot. It seems to be slightly uh, uh, inconsistent. I, I've talked to, I had the opportunity at a major conference in Haifa to be one of the three of us who talked to the Israeli General Forces and I brought out uh, some of my views on the need for uh, psychological warfare is really, you know, they're a very sophisticated group, but they were, the group I was talking to was really seeing force as being necessary in the, uh, the only response. I found it really quite, quite discouraging. We've got time for one final question. 
Paris. Okay, thanks. Um, one of the tenets of neoconservative ideology is that, that terrorism doesn't exist without a state sponsor. Do you buy that? No. <laughs> that, having said that, there's a variety of support uh, in, uh, uh, that, is, that is possible, and uh, many of the uh, states are quietly applauding as terrorist groups carry out work which they see as mobilizing populations against the United, uh, uh, the United States. But there's a, a, a variant from groups who are totally dictated to by the states, uh, and, uh, uh, Hezbollah is but a pretty strong in the influence of Iran, for example, and others who are uh, given safe houses, some, uh, some logistical support, some financial uh, uh, support, but by no means are under that, uh, under that uh, control. But, it would, but uh, we are talking about transnational terrorism now uh, that uh, is, is sub-state level, but that has an international breadth um, in the killing of uh, bin Laden uh, 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 certainly will not end that, nor uh, will the uh, uh, destruction of the, uh, of, uh, the Iraqi leadership, as is already uh, clear, uh, end what seems to be an increasing epidemic. Jerry, thank you very much. Very, very smart. Thank you. My great pleasure.